Welcome to the second Sunday of Easter and to Christ by the Sea United Methodist Church. We have a very special presentation for our online service today. Uh, otherwise, Pastor Jenny is bringing the message at our 9 o'clock and our 11 o'clock service, but our own annual conference led by Bishop Carter will be bringing the presentation today. And so I'm just here to introduce that. And I am so grateful for their work among us. They've They've given much of our staff a break from having to produce an entire worship service. However, we are still in the midst of our stewardship campaign, so I want to introduce to you one of my dear friends and one of our most active members, Joe Parrish, who is going to tell you about her experience of Christ by the sea. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll move right on to her. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the risen Christ and his presence among us. Now, Lord, as we come before him in worship with the church across our annual conference, bring our hearts and minds together as we focus on stewardship and how we can prepare to get the job done in the coming year. Amen and amen. I walked into Christ by the Sea about a year and a half ago. Uh, I was new to the area and I was looking for a church family. I first walked into the Sunday school room because I felt a small group might give me an idea of what the congregation was like. And what I found was a warm, welcoming group of people who studied God's word with joy, with laughter, and seriousness, with respect for one another. It was welcoming. It was, they were easy to be with. It was a wonderful experience. And when I left, I wanted to come back. From the Sunday school room, I walked into the sanctuary, and I heard the most awesome music and it wasn't long after the music stopped that the minister came in to give his sermon. And I was so impressed with his thoughtfulness, with his move, moving words that made me think, made me feel, made me worship our Lord. I was so thankful that I had found Christ by the sea, who would become my church family. You know, a church family is so important because we come together regardless of the color of our skin, regardless of our political beliefs, our past, our actions, our history, and we all become united in that short time that we're worshiping our God. It's an awesome experience. And I found Christ by the Sea to be warm, to be welcoming, to be loving, to be full of joy. And only God can bring that kind of joy. And so I joined the church and made Christ by the Sea my church family. And I am oh so grateful for that. You know, for years I heard about stewardship. I didn't really understand it. In fact, I listened to sermons and I thought, they don't know me. They don't know my circumstances. They don't know how I feel about things. And it was almost like the sermons would go in one ear and out the other. And yet the more I heard the sermons and the more I studied and the more I read the Bible, I began to believe that God was calling me to be a steward, to give, not just of my money, but of my time and my talents. And he calls each of us to do that. After much prayer and much consideration, 
I finally got to the point where I was tithing. And tithing gave me such a joy. It gave me such a sense of peace. And then I began to understand what all those sermons that I had listened to were all about. It wasn't about or for the rich. It wasn't for the people that had a certain color skin or a certain income. It was for each person that loves our Lord. We need to become stewards. It wasn't long after I started tithing that a minister came to me and asked me if I would be chairperson for the capital campaign we were having. They wanted to build a new church. And I said yes. And I have to say, I have never said no to a minister. So please don't share that with Pastor Bruce. But I said yes, and then I had a very heavy heart. Because if I were going to chair this campaign, it meant that I also had to give to it. So do I take the money out of my tithing to give to it? I didn't know. And so then I got worried. I got really worried about what I was to do. And so I prayed and I prayed and I tried to figure out what I, I knew that I couldn't ask the congregation to do something that I wouldn't do or wasn't doing. And so as I prayed, one night I went to sleep and in the middle of the night, I woke up, sat up in bed and I heard a figure. And I heard, that's what you're supposed to give to the capital campaign. So I got up the next morning and I told my husband, I said, do you think we can do that? And he said, honey, if God told you to do it, then that's what we need to do. So I went in, got on my computer and I put it on bill pay. And talking about bill pay, that's such an easy way to give. If you're sick, or you're on vacation, the money is sent to the church and your gift to God is there, whether you're there in person or not. If you are afraid of computers and you don't do that, then go to your bank. If you have a bank account, the bank people will set it up for you and it makes it oh so easy. Tithing gives you peace. And you know, it's not just about worship, it's about trusting God, because God will provide. And I know that because he has for me. We didn't miss the money, the extra money that I gave to the capital campaign. And I had pledged it for three years and we didn't give it just for three years. We continued giving it after the capital campaign had been over. And we never missed a penny of it. And that was God's gifts, not our talents. But then there are the stewardships for talents and for time. You know, we have someone in our church that plays the flute. She plays bells. She sings. She preaches. All that and she's skinny. Now, is that fair? But you know what is so wonderful is that she uses every one of her talents for God. And it is such a blessing to see her and to know her so that you know that yes, it is fair because she gives back to God all those blessings. I'm still looking for some of my talents, but I know this, that I have never stepped out, that I have not stepped out in faith and that God has been behind me and beside me. You know, if we put God first in all that we do, then he will provide and take care of us. 
if God is first in our heart, then that controls our actions, that controls everything that we do, our words. So put God first in your heart and together we can keep the doors of this church open. We can work together and be a loving church family. Thank you so much. Hello, I'm Ken Carter, and I'm honored to serve as the Bishop of the Florida Conference of the United Methodist Church. Uh, today, we offer a worship service to our local churches on the Sunday after Easter, really as a gift to our musicians and worship leaders and technicians and pastors. Uh, we hope that on this Lord's Day, uh, you can have a day of rest and renewal uh, and that God's people can be led uh, in worship. So thank you for sharing in this service. God bless you. Build your kingdom here. Let the darkness fear. Show your mighty hand. Heal our streets.
With all the joy and hope of this Sunday following Easter, will you please receive the call to worship, which comes from Psalm 118, followed by the opening prayer. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Praise the God of this day whose steadfast love endures forever. Praise the God of salvation, who does marvelous things. Praise the God of everlasting life. Let us pray. O God of all our days, we come this morning with eager anticipation. We seek to know you, to see you, to touch you. Open our hearts, that we might experience you anew. Open our lives, that we may be faithful witnesses to your resurrection. May we, with shouts of joy, proclaim your steadfast, liberating love to all people everywhere. Amen. Hello, I'm going to read from the message a few verses from Psalm 98. Shout your praises to God, everybody. Let loose and sing. Strike up the band. Round up an orchestra to play for God. Add on a hundred-voice choir. Feature trumpets and big trombones. Fill the air with praises to King God. Let the sea and its fish give a round of applause with everything living on earth joining it. Let the ocean breakers call out encore and mountains harmonize the finale. A tribute to God when he comes, when he comes to set the earth right. He'll straighten out the whole world. He'll put the world right and everyone in it. Thanks be to God for his word for us today. I invite you to join me for the prayers of the people. You may either close your eyes and just listen to the prayers as they are spoken, or you can also feast your eyes on the images that have been provided. Peace be with you, and also with you. Let us pray. Peace, peace. O Lord our God, we long for your peace. And yet, your peace is not a passive thing. It requires action, for in the very next breath you say, As the Father has sent me, so I send you. But we are not sent unprepared. You breathe the breath of the Holy Spirit, the breath of the living God, right into us. We are sent with your breath in our lungs. We are sent with your breath in our souls, we are sent into your way of peace. Breathe in that Holy Spirit now. Breathe in that life-giving breath. Feel the presence of the risen Christ within you. For Christ has promised to bless those of us who have not seen and yet believe. O oh, Jesus, Messiah, Son of God, we believe. But in that very same breath, we want to cry out with the anguished father of a troubled son, Lord, we believe, but help our unbelief. Our belief seems so fleeting. Sometimes it's so strong and we are so confident in our belief in you. But other times we lose sight of you altogether. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive our unbelief. Forgive us when we want to put our fingers in the nail marks in your hands. Forgive us when we want to reach out to touch the hole in your side. Forgive us when we demand such tangible evidence of your presence and let your blessing fall upon us as ones who have come to believe 
without the benefit of physical sight. We do believe, O Lord our God. We want to be more consistent in our belief so that we can have a kingdom impact. We want to live your active way of peace, your shalom, which means harmony, wholeness, completeness, welfare, and tranquility for all. Shalom is so much more than a greeting. It is our prayer. It is a blessing. It is our deepest desire. It is your benediction on our lives. Peace be with you, you say to each of us. It is a weighty word which carries with it the full blessing of you, our Lord and our God. O oh Jesus, there are so many worshipping with us today who have lost sight of your peace. They have missed their encounter with you. Like Thomas, they have been busy doing other things. And when others have declared, we have seen the Lord, they have been skeptical, demanding physical evidence of your presence. Lord, we understand because we've all been there at different times. Some of us are there now. But let your benediction of peace, your shalom, fall upon all of us who have lost our way, all of us who are too blinded by our grief to be able to see through our tears, all of us who are so busy with the stuff of this life that we've lost sight of you and your way of peace. Open our spiritual inward eyes to see you in all your glory, our risen Lord, our Prince of Peace. Open our ears to hear you say, as the Father has sent me, so now I send you. Open our hearts to be willing to respond to your call to actively live into your way of peace. And continue to breathe your Holy Spirit into us so that we can be assured that we never go alone. You have called all of us, not just individually, but together as a community wherever we are worshipping today, to go with you into your way of peace. We offer ourselves now, crying out for your blessing, but in the confidence of those who believe without having seen. Confident because we've been called and sent by you. Confident that we are your children. And so we pray together in the very words that you have taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory for ever. Amen. May the peace of Christ be with you, and also with you. Amen. Throughout this last year, with all that's been going on, people have remained faithful. Church never closed, only the building for a time. The missional work of the local church continues. And because of your faithfulness and giving, churches have been able to continue with outreach, feeding ministries, and other ways our churches support their community. We are called to serve and love and take care of our neighbors. 
As we continue to worship with this time of offering, please pray with me. Dear gracious and loving Father, please accept these gifts as our commitment to you as we give a portion of what has been given to us. May this offering be multiplied and used to provide for those who are in need. In your holy name, we praise and thank you. Amen. The gospel this morning is taken from the gospel of John chapter 20 and we will be reading from verses 19 through 31 and we read the word of God in the name of the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit on the evening of that first day of the week when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. 
A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen, and yet they have believed. Jesus performed many, many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We gather, many of us a few at a time in our churches, some still in our homes and apartments, after a full year of a global health crisis, a crisis that has changed the way we gather, work, eat meals, travel, see our families and friends, and yes, how we worship. Amidst the change and disruption, there are constants. The scripture, the gospel, and the church year, Advent, Christmas, Epiphany, Lent, and now Easter, and the great 50 days that will lead to Pentecost. We anticipate the coming of the Savior. Jesus is born. The light is given not only to his own people, but to the Gentiles. That's us. He grows in wisdom and stature, in favor with God and the people. He is baptized with and for us. He is tested in the wilderness. He begins his ministry, sets his face toward Jerusalem, comes into conflict with the authorities, political and religious. This leads to arrest, a trial, a sentence of death, and a crucifixion. Now, had the story ended there, we would not be here. I would not be speaking to you. You would not be listening to me. Jesus is placed in a tomb. And three days later, when the women come to anoint the body, he's not there. He has been raised from the dead. A number of eyewitnesses have encountered him and talked about the details of this surprise. They talked with anyone who would listen to them. The church year conveys the scripture. It is our way of telling the story of our life in Christ. Amidst all of the disruptions of this year, we need a constant. Amidst so much that is unfamiliar, we yearn for the familiar ground upon which to stand. Thomas is a family friend on the Sunday after Easter. As a pastor, I came to love this Sunday something of a calm after the storm, the big Easter Sunday celebration. Because it was on this Sunday that I became acquainted with Thomas. In the Eastern Orthodox Church, 
This day is sometimes referred to as St. Thomas Sunday. The tradition credits Thomas with taking the gospel to India in the first century. Many of us know him as Doubting Thomas. But our Orthodox friends remember instead that he confessed his faith. My Lord and my God, mi Señor y mi Dios. In the Gospel of John, Thomas is in conversation with Jesus about the faith, and included in that faith is struggle and doubt. If the women are the first evangelist, then we can designate Thomas as the first seeker. Jesus has risen and is about to leave the disciples. Thomas asked him, We do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus responds, I am the way and the truth and the life. El camino, la verdad y la vida. Thankfully, the disciples allowed Thomas his quest. In his skepticism, he speaks for all of us who come to faith and continue in faith with perseverance and struggle. We are all on our different passages and pilgrimages through COVID, and we search for some basis of faith and hope. In the midst of perseverance, struggle, and doubt, have you known any of this the last 50 weeks? We look for signs. The Gospel of John is a book of signs. Water into wine, feeding the hungry multitudes, giving sight to the blind. These are signs. Jesus is the Word made flesh, something we can sense. And so Thomas declares, I will not believe unless I see in his hands the nail prints and place my finger in his wounds. In other words, he wants to experience it for himself. Jesus' question, have you believed because you have seen me? Have you believed because you have seen me? Indicates that he did not think too highly of those who were always looking for a sign, a proof. But he follows this comment with a beatitude. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. This would include generations of women and men. This would include you and me. We come to faith not because of the experience of Thomas, but because of the signs that are written in the book. Signs that don't resolve all of our struggles and doubts but lead us to take the next faithful step. There's a story of a woman who asked her son to go out into the darkness of night to check and see that the door to the family's barn is locked. The son steps out of the house but quickly, the son returns to say that it's so dark that he can't see the barn. She hands him a flashlight and directs him again to the task, only to have him return again to say that the flashlight is weak and he still cannot see the barn. Finally, the mother sends her son into the night a third time with the instruction, you don't need to see the barn, just walk to the end of your light. 
My friend Gil Rendell has commented, <coughs> commented that when we walk to the end of our light, the next portion of the path is revealed. We take the next faithful step. With Jesus, it's not if you see, you will believe. With Jesus, it is if you believe, you'll see. One of the saints of the church, Anselm, expressed it this way, I believe in order that I might understand. And so for the believer, all of life is a sign. Musicians and pastors and technicians preparing worship services, wondering who they're connecting with on the other side of the computer device. Servants in local churches preparing meals for our hungry neighbors. Imagine we have shared more than three million meals across this annual conference with hungry persons. In the first quarter of this year, one of our larger churches contacted us and said, we've been blessed and we know that some of our churches may be struggling. Would it help if we gave our full connectional gift at the beginning of the year? Signs. It could be that this has been a year where the signs have been infrequent. The intimacy of touch may have been few and far between. In our own family, every birthday celebration this year was a Zoom call. March, May, August, October. And yet, we have all taken the next faithful step. A step out of the darkness into the light. A step out of the enclosed tomb and into the fresh wind of the risen Jesus and his life in the Spirit. It is a most unusual Thomas Sunday. We will all come out of COVID as different people, I'm convinced. We're all likely trying to make sense of it. There have been fightings without and fears within. Half a million of our citizens have died. 30,000 Floridians have passed. We have not fully processed this. Many jobs lost, many dreams postponed, political divisions, mental exhaustion. And if we are honest, many of us wanted to predict and control and plan the future. A year of COVID has taught me that this is not within my power. As much as I would like, I cannot see all the way to the barn. When Jesus said he was the way, the truth, and the life, he then went on to say, I go to prepare a place for you. I have read that passage more times than I can count as I have stood with families at a graveside. I go to prepare a place for you. Voy a prepares un lugar. What we know is that we would be wise to focus not only on the destination, but on the journey. The way is Jesus. His birth, his baptism, his teaching. He calls us. He suffers for us. His prophetic voice, his miracles, his willingness to confront the powerful, 
the meal he shared and shares with us, his death, his risen life. The risen Jesus is near to us in the journey in every one of these places. All the way he is with us. He has perhaps been nearer to us in this season of disruption and testing, fightings without and fears within, struggles and doubts. Nearer to us than we would have known. Jesus asks only that we believe, which can be a faith the size of a mustard seed, he says in one of his parables, which can be like taking the smallest step to the end of all the light we can see. And there is a beatitude for the faithful church. Benditos los que creen sin verme. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. On behalf of the Cabinet of the Florida Annual Conference, we are so glad that you have been with us in worship today. Now receive this blessing. May we journey together, growing in our faith and our belief in Jesus Christ, remembering that indeed the tomb was empty and now being sent out to share the good news with everyone so that everyone may declare, like Thomas, my Lord and my God. Amen. Thank you.